Hello, this is a detailed guide for radiologists and radiology residents on how to do tomosynthesis guided breast biopsies. In this movie, we will be using the Hologic Affirm Upright uh, Tomosynthesis Unit and the ATEC Aviva Needle, but the same principles apply to any equipment that you're using. So when would we do a tomosynthesis guided breast biopsy? Well, you can do pretty much any lesion which is visible by mammography, but when would we use this unit as opposed to uh, a regular prone stereotactic unit? Well, lesions that are only visible tomographically obviously need a tomographic means of biopsy. Patients who can't lie down on their stomachs for a prone stereo. And we've also found it's very good for very posterior lesions in the breast. And it is a much faster means of biopsy if um, this becomes an issue. What's it not so good for? Very faint calcifications can be sometimes difficult to see on the tomo uh, biopsy unit. Uh, it's become less of a problem as we've had more experience, however. Very long procedures such as double biopsies. The patients are a little bit more prone to fainting if you have them in the upright position. Uh, if you do not have a decubitus table, in, if you must use an inferior approach and you do not have a decubitus table, then you will need to use the prone table for biopsying those lesions. And finally, because patients are often biopsy in the upright position, if they are prone to vasal vagal episodes, then you're going to want to have them preferably in the prone position for that. We're going to go into some detail about the tumor biopsies here, but we've assumed that you've already watched the regular stereo biopsy movie and you're aware of the concepts around vacuum needle biopsies, um, the concepts about stroke margins for stereotactic biopsies and the indications for stereo biopsies, as we will not be going into those here. Before you start the biopsy, you have to identify to the technologist what approach you're going to use. Generally speaking, you want this to be the approach that's closest to the skin surface, or sometimes you're going to want to be using the approach that would allow you to distinguish the calcifications best. Let's illustrate this on this patient. So we have our CC view and our true lateral view, and this patient has three groups of calcifications. Number one, number two, and number three. And the same here, number one. Now, calcification groups two and three are directly overlying each other on the lateral view. Now to go at group one, we can either come from a lateral approach or we could come from a CC and it doesn't really matter a whole lot with group one, it's pretty much equal distances. With group two, however, although it's slightly closer to the lateral side of the breast than it is on a cranial caudal biopsy, it is overlying group calcification group three when we look from the true lateral view and it'd be very difficult to be sure that we're actually getting group two. So I would want to come from a CC approach so I can isolate group two. Let's look at group three. Well, group three is pretty deep in the breast. It's pretty much straight retro areola. It's equal distance between the medial and the lateral aspects of the breast and is closer to the superior or the cranial aspect of the breast, same as group two is here. And again, I would use a cranial caudal approach to biopsy group three. Here is a radiograph of the phantom that we're going to be using to demonstrate tomographic biopsies. This is a ham with eggshells injected in the center, which you can see very nicely here. Just to talk very briefly about positioning the patient. Of note, in this video, we are only going to show you positioning of the patient in the upright position and not in the decubitus position. The breast is put in a moderate amount of compression after placing it on the image receptor plate, really just enough to keep it immobilized during the procedure. This is a patient who has been positioned for a cranial caudal approach for a tomo-guided biopsy. You can see our compression plate here with the hole in it. Uh, note that you always want to put some good padding behind them to make sure that the patient doesn't move, make sure they're comfortable before you start. And here is a patient who has been positioned for a lateral approach, the same applies. Uh, we will often put sterile tegaderm 
um, between the paddle and the patient. Here, this helps the uh, breast compress some, and it also stops the patient's uh, breast from moving within the device during the biopsy. So now your patient is already positioned correctly. Let's move on to imaging the lesion and targeting. This is the Hologic Tomobiopsy Unit screen, and we're pretty much always going to start by doing some form of a scalp, depending on the projection, to just make sure that our lesion was in the field of view. So here's our scout image. You just want to check the borders of the paddle opening to make sure that your lesion, seen very clearly here, is well within those borders. And then you go on and do the first TOMO image for targeting. Here's a scroll through of the initial set of targeting images from the scout TOMO. Just showing how that cluster of calcifications comes in and out of the focal plane. On the Hologic Affirm unit, you use this scroll bar here to go through the tomographic images to select the slice which shows the, the target best, and then left click to select the target once you have the cursor over the lesion. So you scroll through your tomographic images to find the best target once you've found it, left click the mouse in the center of the target. You then want to select that check mark on the left which will send it to the device. If it's not the needle you want, select the correct needle. In this case we're using the 12 millimeter Aviva Petite needle. And then finally, once you've confirmed your targets, touch that little mail sign, the envelope sign, and it will send it to the gantry. So we've selected our device here, and it's the petite needle in this case. We've sent it using this little envelope sign here, which shows now our target coordinates. And it's at that point it's going to come up with a screen below. Let's zoom in and take a closer look at this. So what we want to see on this screen is we want to see all three of these figures here being shown in purple. This top one here shows us a sufficient depth between the most proximal part of the chamber and the skin surface. The middle one here tells us that um, this will be when we are correctly at target, so it should be zero. And this bottom figure shows us the distance between the back of the deployed needle and the back of the breast or the image receptor plate here. And again, you obviously want that to be a positive figure. If any of these are shown in red, then that shows that you have inadequate um, distance either between the device and the skin or the device and the image receptor plate at the back. Before the gantry is moved, read the coordinate uh, of the target out to the technologist and have her out loud confirm those with you. The gantry is moved to the coordinates by pinching both the front and the back buttons here at the same time. You can do it on either side of the display unit here. And well, here we can see those buttons changing as she pushes those buttons. Now you'll notice that although the coordinates were sent to target, and you can see here that these are the target coordinates that you can confirm off the console, there is a difference between the position that the needle is now and the required target coordinates. It's just a tiny bit in the X direction, it's more in the Y, and it's significantly more in the Z. The reason that there is a difference in the Y is because of the angle of the gantry that I'm going to uh, show you in a minute. And the difference in the Z here is because the needle has not yet been advanced into the position, the target position you want to have it before you deploy the needle. It's still well up and away from the patient. But you'd like to see, you need to see the X is yellow, Y is yellow, not green yet, and we don't worry about Z at the current time. This just shows you the angle of the gantry with the device as it advances towards the breast in the coordinate system that's used by Hologic. This is X, and so it should be centered correctly for X. Y is 
this distance here. And so it's not until the needle is advanced down to the correct D depth that that Y coordinate will become correct, as we'll see in a minute. Here is what we have on our prep tray. We have chlorhexidine for cleaning. We have two syringes of local anesthetic, a 10 cc without epi and a 20 cc of 1% lidocaine with epi. Our scalpel, mosquito forceps, a uh, 20 gauge spinal needle that we use if, uh, for deep anesthesia if we need it. Our uh, Stoi strips and some uh, Q-tips for applying the benzoin solution, gauze swabs, and then we have our clip that we're going to use ready on the tray. After the gantry has been moved to the correct position, you then want to get the technologist to swing the uh, camera arm out of the way for her to be able to get the needle into position. It won't slide on if that camera is uh, directly ahead of it. Um, once we're at this stage, we're then ready to start with uh, preparing the patient's skin. So clean it thoroughly. We use chlorhexidine solution. And then wind the needle down until it's very close to the patient's skin surface. You can see here and that will help you identify the exact spot where you need to apply the local anesthesia. We start by giving about 5 cc's of 1% lidocaine without epinephrine. We angle the needle as we find it helps us direct it appropriately along the track we want to use. You want to make sure you get a very nice um, subdermal bleb of anesthesia and then inject down from there to approximate target depth. Uh, Mary Mayhem here doesn't have a dermis, but I think you get the idea. We then change to 1% lidocaine with epinephrine and inject about another 5 cc's, um, maybe up to 7 cc's, this time deeper to make sure that you go to full needle depth. And as you can see, Jason here is injecting around the needle as we go. Detach. The remainder of that syringe 1% right, lidocaine okay. with epi goes onto the back injection port. This is to show you the point of attachment for the 1% uh, lidocaine with epi syringe. Note that it goes onto the white tap, not the gold tap. The gold tap has the irrigation solution. Make a vertical scalpel nick, go down to the green plastic on the needle. That. Use mosquito yeah. forceps to yeah. open yeah. up your scalpel yeah. nick and just hold it open yeah. as you wind the needle down. If there's some you skin tethering, you're often yeah. fine. You have to kind of pull All back right, so a little now. bit while opening up that nick to prevent the skin through. being pushed so down. Much than breast tissue. Wind so down, now do we down want to right, so now we we'll just now we'll like come down see like to here. the chest. Just, you need just to wind the it down. Okay. Okay. Until everything okay. is Go. green wind it down. All right. on your display window. Now you can see that the needle has been wound down to the correct target position prior to deploying the needle, and that both that X, Y, and Z, shown here, should all be showing green. If they're not showing green, you need to check your position. Always make sure that your needle guard here is advanced close to, but not directly touching the skin surface before you deploy the needle and before you do any biopsies. Before you deploy the needle, tell the patient they'll hear a noise like a champagne cork. I usually do All right, one, you're going to hear a popping deploy. noise at the count of three. One, two, three. Back of the device. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, Just and one, two, three. With the needle out of the patient it goes forward two centimeters of regular needle or 12 millimeters for the petite. We then inject another approximately five cc's of lidocaine through the back port, gradually turning the needle round in the patient to get all areas of the proposed biopsy site as you go. We're now ready to start biopsying. To press your foot on the foot pedal, usually tell the patients that there's going to be a loud whirring noise, similar to a dental drill. Every time the machine beeps, 
it is taking a biopsy and you turn the back of the needle device through a uh, two o'clock position. We usually take six biopsies initially and then uh, radiograph them. So starting here at 12, beep, move to two o'clock, beep, four o'clock and so on until you've gone all the way around. At that point you switch the machine into lavage mode. Here are the controls on the vacuum unit attached to the uh, biopsy needle. Um, when you are performing biopsies, this is going to be deployed. You then use the lavage button to be able to flush irrigation solution through the vacuum needle and the biopsies back into the pot. And then you'll need to go back into biopsy mode if you need to do more biopsies. As the lavage mode runs, you will see one or two more additional specimens running through the tubing down into the specimen pot. This is really important to get those last specimens. Make the, the specimen pot a little dependent to help the flow and gradually turn the needle round in the patient to irrigate the cavity. Undo the gold connection and that will flush the uh, last of the saline into the pot and you can then remove the basket, replace it with a second clean basket and do it back up and reattach your saline flush, that's the gold tap there at the end to keep some irrigation going while you check the specimens. In patients who have non-calcified lesions, we will do a second tomosynthesis image to look at the site of the biopsy cavity. And we're going to be comparing the site of that cavity, in particular the level, with the original images uh, which were taken before the biopsy. Use mosquito forceps to spread your specimens out on the wet filter paper. And then radiograph them using a conventional mammographic unit on magnification setting or in a specimen unit as shown here. We use the Trident specimen unit for our specimen radiographs. It's very nice to so put the specimen in and then you just press this x-ray button until it beeps. Before you start, you always just want to check that the correct patient identification is up on the attached computer screen. When you place the specimens in the unit, if you're on the bottom rung, which is the lower degree of magnification, these rungs here and here, you need to have all of the specimens within the outer set of squares. If, however, you need a higher degree of magnification, for example, with really fine calcifications, you move this perspex tray here up to these higher rungs, and you must then have all your specimens within the inner set of squares, or they will be off the image. Here's the specimen image that comes up. Here's what we see. Um, on the trident after the image has been taken up and you can see here there's a variety of different options to be able to zoom, magnify or change the grade scale. Uh, you can also do some basic annotations and then once you're happy with the image just select close patient and the image will print. To remove the Eviva device you need to press the little plastic lever here and then just pull straight up and out of the patient. There are several different clips you can use for the device. You need to make sure that if you're using a petite needle, you use a clip designed for that needle. There are also several different shapes. And there are different clips if you have a very superficial lesion. And you can just check with the technology manufacturers your particular needle as to what clip you should use in that circumstance. Always be very careful not to touch the sterile end of these clips um, before you insert in device and we recommend that you change your gloves after doing the biopsy uh, and immediately before inserting this clip. The clips are deployed just by depressing this uh, plunger until it clips after you've hubbed the device in the sheath. So here we're removing the needle from the sheath. Let's take it out carefully and given it to the technologist. We're then going to place the clip, fully engage the clip until it clicks, deploy the plunger, turn it through about 180 degrees and then carefully remove it, leaving the sheath in position to take your post 
clip uh, tomosynthesis view. And here it is that tomosynthesis view. We have the original post biopsy one at the top. We have our clip at the bottom, and we're just checking to confirm that the clip is at approximately the same level. So here is the specimen radiograph from our patients. You can see we got a little over-enthusiastic with inserting our eggshells here, so we have plenty of calcifications, not all of them within specimens, but we usually identify for the technologist the specimens which contain calcifications, and they put those into a separate pot. So the technologist will use the radiographs to be able to separate out the, the specimens that have calcifications, from those specimens which do not, and this aids the pathologist. Once you've confirmed the clip position, you can rotate the sheath out of the patient, take the compression off her breast, and apply some compression to her incision for about five minutes. We would obviously at this point normally be removing the patient away from the device. Over the incision, we put a little bit of uh, benzoin compound to help the steri strips adhere. And then we use two to three steri strips across the incision, making sure you efface the edges nicely. The technologist will, uh, after she has performed the post procedure mammogram, which we're not going to show, which you use to confirm clip position, she will put a compression bandage on the patient. Don't forget, if this was a TOMO-only visible lesion that you are biopsying, you should do a 3D mammogram after the procedure to check the clip position, not just a 2D. And that's pretty much it.